scour the news about the African continent, and more often than not, the news is bad, whether it's the spread of infectious diseases, the exploitation of resources, the corruption of governments, or the violence of extremist factions. African nations are struggling and have been struggling for a long time. The end of Western colonialism was supposed to be a new chapter, holding the promise of independence and wealth. But the process of Africanization meant that power structures created by colonialism were left in place. Perhaps only the names and faces were different. In the Eastern African nation of Tanzania, one leader named Julius Nyerere foresaw the dangers and led a bold experiment that employed existing rural principles of agriculture with progressive ideals that involved anti-sexism and anti-classism. It was called in the language of Kiswahili Ujamaa, which roughly translates into familyhood. The concept was a traditional Tanzanian framework of socialism under which intentional villages were organized. While the concept blossomed and manifested into many villages, proving that development could mean equality and anti-capitalism, it was a short-lived experiment. Luckily, a Rhodesian man named Raf Ebot and his wife Noreen witnessed the flowering of Ujama and documented it in book form. That book has recently been re-released with a, an introduction by my guest, Selma James, who also co-edited the book. Selma James is an internationally renowned women's rights and human rights activist. She's also the author of Sex, Race and Class, The New Terms of Unity. She's the founder of the International Wages for Housework campaign, the coordinator of the global women's strike. I'm so so pleased to welcome her in studio today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I should say welcome back. We had you on about your book, uh, and it's uh, wonderful to have you on the show. I'm delighted to be back. Thank you. So first, uh, this uh, incredible concept that is something that is not very familiar to us in the West. Before we get into that, let's uh, step back and talk about history. Tanzania got its independence from Britain in 1961, and Julius Nyerere was its first prime minister. He was an extraordinary man. Tell us a little bit he about him. He was absolutely extraordinary. He came out of his village of Butyama when he was 12 years old for the first time and learned how to read and write. He went to school when he was 12. And the most extraordinary thing about him was though he got a couple of degrees later on, he retained the view of the village that remained his point of reference. That was how he saw the world, and that's how he thought his policies should be based on, was what the village needed. He began really very early. He wrote a paper when he was still at university on the treatment of women in African society, and he thought it was absolutely horrendous. And as he grew in stature and also in power in Tanzania, he outlined just how hard women worked. He said they work all the hours um, in every week. And he said men are on leave for half their lives. And that had to change. It had to change if the society was to develop for women's sake, for men's sake, and for the nation's sake. Mm -hmm. And um, he was incorruptible and always responsive to the needs of the grassroots. Now, you don't get that yeah. in anybody else. And he had incredible foresight. He realized that if we simply left the structures in place left by colonialism, that it would spell doom for many African nations, including Tanzania. And so he had this uh, just this incredible idea of, the, I mean, and explain how he came to this idea, because it wasn't something brand new that he just invented. He actually developed it along with existing traditional principles, right? Yes. He knew that they had to do something to get the country out of the poverty um, that colonialism had left it in. They didn't have any specialists. They had no doctors, no nurses, let alone the idea of a hospital was very far away. They had no teachers. They had no educated, skilled people. He said, but what we have is a collective a communal principle and tradition. And we can use that tradition to develop, to develop the people within the villages, which is for him what development was, and bypass capitalism at the same time. He said, however, the traditional society had two weaknesses which we must address. Mm. The first is the fact that women were subordinate to men and worked very much harder than they did. And the second was that it didn't get them out of poverty. So they had to 
do agriculture in a more organized and scientific way, and they had to relieve women of the burdens, and the men had to share the burden of work of the society, but working together in the old principles of communalism, they could do this. And he said to the people of Tanzania, do it, you must do it, because nobody else could do it for them. Mm. He understood that. Either the people did it or it wasn't done. Right. And some people did it, and they were tremendously successful, and the idea spread. And they developed ways of getting everybody's view and bringing the women into decision-making, not as a little clique or a few people that were led in, but that the whole community met two or three times a week and had a meal together served by the young people, not by the women. Young men and women. That's right. And then they made the decisions for the following days, the whole village. So these, uh, it, it sounds like um, overlapping principles of collectivism and socialism. Uh, tell us about the Arusha Declaration, uh, the policy of the party that uh, Julius Nyerere um, uh, led on socialism and self-reliance um, and, and, and how it laid out in clear terms that it was important that a few people Will not be allowed to just benefit from the work That's of right. many. That's right. He was against capitalism. He said most people work, but few people benefited. He said we're against that. We Africans do not have that tradition. Everybody works in African society and everybody benefits. And he said that is the principle on which we must build our economy and our social relationships. And by 1967, the villages of the Ruvuma Development Association, they began with one, and then they were two, and then they were four, and then they formed an association of all the villages, and finally they were 17 by about 1967 when he issued the Arusha Declaration to say, we want Ujamaa, and we want to limit the power of ministers of government and anybody in authority and to limit their wealth so they could only own one house. And for the purposes of the Arusha Declaration, he said, that means the man and his wife or the woman and her husband. So <laughs> one house to a family and various other measures, which was to undermine the growing corruption, which naturally flowed from a few people getting power in the society and the imperialists always ready to buy their way back. Right. And it was, it, it was it, what is astonishing to me is that as famous as it was in the 20th century, in the 60s and the 70s, by the 21st century, people say, what is the Arusha Declaration? Because it was even out of print in Tanzania wow. before we reprinted it in 2007. Hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the villages. I understand that they were limited in size on they purpose were. because uh, right. after certain, uh, you know, when, it, when things get too big and get too unwieldy, then power structures can develop. What did they look like? Well, they they were very successful. One village, the village of Litoa, which started out, and people came to them and said, well, we'd like to join. And they said, well, I'm afraid you can't because we want to limit the size so that when we come together, everyone will have a chance to speak. Everyone will be completely engaged, and everybody really was engaged in the society. They said, but we will help you to form your own village, and we will give you food to start out with. We will train you. We will share our skills with you. And most important, we are building a school in Litoa and your children will be educated there for free and I wanted, with us. I want to talk about that school because that's very important. You have a big part of your bo of the book by Ralph Abot um, that you co-edited uh, on that school. But but uh, just staying on this for a little bit. So so the vision, as I understand it, was that rural Tanzania would consist of these villages whose standards of living would little by little increase to right. that of urban Absolutely. centers. Uh, but they would still need the state to enforce some of 
of the aspects of the Arusha Declaration to make sure that, uh, th that there would be equal distribution of, ro of wealth and resources? N not really. <laughs> Within the villages was the d equal distribution So there was of full autonomy. They were not only autonomous of the government, mm -hmm. but Nero they told that kept saying, leave them alone, do not interfere with them. It's not Ujama unless the people are absolutely the people doing it are absolutely in charge. And he fought his own government to keep them to keep their hands off. They they, they wanted to be in charge. They were power hungry as politicians right. always are. How did they how did they administer justice then, for example, when there were issues of crime and justice and, and We didn't have crime in the, I say we, you know, I feel <laughs> I'm living in these villages, but they didn't have crime in those villages. They sometimes had people who didn't want to work. Yeah. Sometimes, not often. Um, and then they would have a meeting and say, look, you know, you're not pulling your weight. Mm. And if he didn't, they would ask him to leave. And this is, again, part of this whole concept of familyhood, because when you have a family, uh, you try to work things out. Uh, you By don't consensus, toss your own members no of your voting. family in jail. <laughs> Absolutely. That is exactly right. And he called it African socialism as opposed to the socialism that he had seen when he was at university in the UK being built, the welfare state. Right. But that was the welfare state was to uh, protect people from the work worst aspects of capitalism. But Ujama was not about that. It was not to have capitalism in the first place and for the people to be in charge of their own production, development, when they built houses, when they improved them, what kind of education they had, um, what were the relationships among them which were very straightforward. And one of the most extraordinary things is that they really didn't have any domestic violence in the villages. Wow. because And you ask them at the time, why not? And they would say, well, we don't really approve of it. That is, the opinions were good and sound and not sexist. So and the weight of other people's opinion mm. in the village really mattered and was a power and was effective. So people held each other accountable. They did. Yeah. That is exactly right. Mm. They held each other accountable and they found that this was a joyous life. Everybody said, you know, that they were very happy in Tanzania. This is totally going against the U.S.-centric, the, the sort of what you find here in the United States, a celebration of personal and individual responsibility and freedom. This is collective responsibility. And it these is. are almost sort of uh, opposite views of how society could function and be. Yes, and that didn't mean there wasn't individuality because individuality flourished in these circumstances mm -hmm. because they were living in a society which was not against them. You know, we are not aware sometimes at how much the society that we live in stands against us, not only if we're people of color, but if we're women and if we're children and if we're the elderly and if we're poor. The society doesn't seem to be on our side but against us, we thrive perhaps despite this, but not because of it. And the Ujama society, they were making it to suit themselves and for everybody to find their way together. I'm speaking with Selma James, who is actually on a speaking tour of the United States. And she is she just returned actually from uh, Philadelphia for our audience in Los Angeles. She's going to be speaking tomorrow at uh, Saturday, April 4th at 4 p.m. at the Southern California Library, 6120 South Vermont Avenue. She's going to be speaking alongside Pierre Labossiere and Margaret Prescott. Uh, she's on her tour with Nina Lopez, who also co-edited the book Ujama. And uh, the event is called From Ujama, The Hidden Story of Tanzania's Socialist Villages to Today's Black Jacobins in Haiti, uh, which is the topic of another uh, interview as well. She's also going to be for our uh, Bay Area audience in the Berkeley, San Francisco, Oakland areas. A uh, number of events, Berkeley Sunday, April 26th, so the weekend after. Uh, before that, she will be in, San, uh, in um, Oakland uh, Wednesday, April 22nd at 6.30 p.m. in... Uh, 
the at the LA uh, the LA Commune Bookstore and Cafe, and Thursday, April twenty third, uh, as well at six p.m. Uh, Friday, to April twenty fourth, at eleven a.m. and five p.m. at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Saturday, April twenty fifth, at the Crucible in uh, Oakland, from one to two p.m. We'll post all of this information on our website, uprisingwithsonali.com. Also in New York for our New York audience, Thursday, April thirtieth, from four to six p.m. at the Commons thirty eight. 388 Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn. So we post all of that at uprisingwithsonali.com. Salma, let's turn to the Litoa School because yes. the education of children was crucial to pass on the collective knowledge, the principles and the ideas of Ujamaa, uh, not only to pass them on to the second generation, but also to spread them far and wide beyond these villages. How were these schools run? Well, first of all, they were building Ujamaa. This wasn't handed to them. Right. They were making the society every day. And the first and most important thing about the school was that it was not competitive. The, the children were not competing with each other. Can you imagine no a school? No grades, no testing? <laughs> That's right. Can you imagine a school where children are not vying for top marks against the people they care about and their colleagues. It was not like that. They worked together. The question was to be collective and cooperative. And the kids were, that's how they were raised. And that's how the school was run. And they were learning all kinds of skills that have to do with living in a rural society so that they were not on track to then go into the city and get a degree and be in charge of people like villagers rather than be part of an expanding and developing really imaginative and creative society. And they were also would go to the, they went to the headmaster. I know in one case, because the headmaster told us that the man who was at that time, they came and they said, we don't want this guy to be in charge. And he paid no attention. And they said, excuse me, we don't want this guy to be in charge. And he said, well, I had to remove him, didn't I? You know, <laughs> because the kids had some views about the way they wanted government, their government, the government of their society or their corner of society to be run. And they, they learned all kinds of skills, including from the Ibbots, uh, Ralph and Noreen Ibbot and their children. And they brought the skills that they had learned in Western society, and they made them available, and the children learned at one so point. So this, this was not a Luddite experiment. Tell indeed. us about Ralph Abbott and, and Noreen Abbott. Um. Well, at one point, the village, one of the villages, which uh, had some part of quite chilly on the mountaintop, near the mountain, uh, decided to grow um, sheep and, the, and, and do wool. Noreen imported a spinning wheel and learned how to use it and taught others how to use it. And so they had wool yarn and everybody in the village would go around knitting down the road. Women and men were knitting because it got cold in the, yeah. in the, in the evening in the winter. And that was how the children, you know, learned what Noreen and Ralph brought with them. At one point, Ralph was able to get in Litoa, and then he was working on getting it for the other villages, piped water without electricity. And they, the women said it was just like heaven because there was no more fetching of water, which usually was women's and children's work. That was grinding work, very difficult work. So, 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 step back and tell us who the the Ibbots were. This Rhodesian couple. They no, they were they were English. They were English. Well, she, he was English, and she was raised in Ireland, ah. and they worked in Rhodesia. I see for about a decade against apartheid. They were trying to run a multiracial cooperative farm mm. and they had problems with the apartheid church and with the government there and the rest. But he, Ralph and Nori learned a great deal. Three of their, first three of their children were born there in Rhodesia and he learned about the soil and he learned about farming, and he learned about helping collectivity without being in charge. Mm. And so when he was invited by 
Milinga, who was the leader of Litoa village and the leader of the whole enterprise, probably an extraordinary man from every account, when they invited the, the Ibbits to come, Ralph and Noreen had some African experience behind them. They never attended a meeting where decisions were made. I see. They, they stayed, stayed out of it. outside yeah. of the government of the villages, but they were available for advice consultants. and for help. <laughs> they were consultants, <laughs> and they got 50 yeah. pounds a year, I think. That was their wage from a, a charity in England. Yeah, yeah. For and doing it, that, yeah. it was a prototype of how Europeans, mm -hmm. or indeed Americans, can be available to non-industrial countries. It sounds like true solidarity without yeah. being in charge. Yeah, it sounds like that solidarity is, at its purest form. what I know. <laughs> yeah. Can you yeah. use this information? And Yerere was the man who promoted that. You mentioned in your intro something about Africanization. Yeah. He was not really interested in Africanization. He was interested in the best people doing the work and African people be governing themselves uh, in a way that prevented the domination of the specialist, of the educated, of the Technocrat. The technocrats, that yeah. was his his uh, his point of view. That was his direction because he needed. The, he saw that a country like Tanzania needed what the West had to offer, but it didn't need the domination of the West. It needed the co collective wisdom of the people in an active and ongoing way. What happened to these villages? You mentioned at the at its uh, peak, it was 17 villages. And, and I want to sort of circle back to what I started out with, which is that um, you know, post-colonialism in Africa has been more tragedy, uh, at least for certain countries, than, than success. Many successes took place, well, one, but the problem was to keep the ambitious at bay and to discipline those who had positions of power. And it's, you know, it's all the same everywhere. We're having the same problem in the UK Absolutely. and you're having a lot of it in the US. The politicians want to do their way, which profits them, which promotes them, which increases their power. And we are often not organized enough, or there are not enough of us organized, to defeat that and to find our own way. And that's what happened to the 17 villages of Tanzania, the Ruvuma Development Association. They had the support all the way of the president. You know, he backed them constantly but he could not defeat the leadership of his own party. And those are the ones who he went on a trip, um, some international meeting that he had to attend, and as soon as he was out of the country, they destroyed the villages so that they were destroyed by the time he got back. So and party he was shocked politics, by what they had done. Party politics destroyed the it, it was the ambitious. It was those in the party who were ambitious, mm. those who were in the government. You know, there were signs that this was a, the problem, this was the basic problem, because at one point, you know, he had said that uh, university students had to do voluntary work for the community, and they said they didn't want to, and he just, he closed the university he said, you mean we are paying, the people are paying for your education and you don't want to work for we, them, go home. We just have a few uh, seconds left, Salma. Uh, what's the promise that Ujama holds for a model for organizing today? I think the principles of Ujama, the way people uh, worked, the way they um, controlled their leadership and in fact encouraged their leadership without domination, um, and the structures that they uh, devised in order to govern themselves, and the principles on which the collective cooperative principles on which they organize their society can be learned and can be used in any circumstance. We in the Global Women's Strike, we use Ujamaa as our guide for organizing ourselves and for promoting 
all who do the same. And uh, that story is available. Those principles are embodied in this in this book by Ralph Ebert that you have uh, co-edited and written an introduction for Ujama, the hidden story of Tanzanian socialist villages. Salma James, thank you as always for joining us. I'm delighted. Thank you. My guest Salma James is an international women's rights and human rights activist. She's also the author of Sex, Race and Class, The New Terms of Unity and the founder of the International Wages for Housework Campaign, coordinator of the Global Women's Strike. If you'd like information on her events and appearances in uh, Southern California, the Bay Area, and New York, go to uprisingwithsonali.com. A little bit